And using functional MRI, we've been able to demonstrate that in one of the networks, we assessed eight networks, including the de default mode network, and in only one of them was there a significant relationship between functional connectivity and brain ketone uptake. And that was in the dorsal attention network, which is mapped here to this area in red. Uh, here and, and here superimposed on the ketone uptake in the brain. Again, this is the first time that anyone, as far as we know, has attempted to relate the functional connectivity in a particular network to the energy metabolism in that network. And we're seeing here a strong correlation between the functional connectivity in the dorsal attention network and the uptake of ketones in that same network. And when we look at, again, uh, the fifth dimension of, of, of cognition, the uh, attention and processing speed, this is the Z-score for tests that involve attention and processing speed, and more specifically, the TMT or the trail making test, both the visual scanning speed and the number sequencing. And in all three cases, we see a strong positive correlation with the Z-score or a strong negative correlation with the processing speed. So time is going down. That's an improvement in the, in the trail making test in relation to the functional connectivity. So there's a relationship between the functional connectivity, the improvement in cognition in, in relation to attention and the availability of ketones or the improved energy status of the brain. So if we come back to the schematic I was showing you earlier about this vicious cycle, just to remind you that the chronic brain energy deficit seems to be fed by a pre-symptomatic glucose problem. We don't know yet the relationship with the brain pathology, but I'll show you what we have learned uh, uh, recently in the, in the next slide. And this is the vicious cycle that we envisage that we're trying to break up. In terms of neuropathology, we've recently had the Zetterberg lab, which is one of the key reference labs in the world, measure the plasma biomarkers of Alzheimer's disease neuropathology in this study, the Benefic trial. And as you can see quickly, um, there's no change in the phosphatau 231, the phosphatau 181, the beta amyloid 40 or 42, the glial fibrillary acetic protein or the neurofilament light. These are the main markers that can be measured in blood. There's usually a correlation between the presence of these markers and the progression of the disease. And we're seeing that there is no change in the neuropathology by this indirect measure after having given a ketogenic MCT or the placebo uh, in mild cognitive impairment. So in this schematic, what we're showing with the ketone treatment is that we're improving brain energy status so we're helping to reduce the impact of brain glucose hypometabolism on the brain. We're in definitely improving functional connectivity and probably white matter integrity in the brain. We don't know whether there's actually been any change in the neuropathology by the indirect measure of plasma. That doesn't seem to be the case. And we're by this uh, approach, uh, we're in reducing the impact on the cognitive domain, so improved cognitive function and we seem to be reducing, therefore, the impact on deteriorating brain energy metabolism. Uh, we don't know yet whether we've actually delayed the progression of the disease. It's going to take a longer term trial, but it looks like we're inhibiting this vicious cycle. So but what is the context then of nutritional ketosis as a lifestyle intervention? I mentioned that we've used ketogenic MCT. You can also use salts or esters as different forms of supplements. They haven't been shown yet to improve cognition in any type of long-term study in uh, the elderly, but this is going to come. It's going to take a placebo treatment, which at the moment I'm not aware of any placebos for these, for these types of supplements. I think the ketone supplements are a contribution. I think we can also improve some of the issues associated with metabolic dysregulation by some carbohydrate restriction. I'm gonna show you on the next slide that this is an approach that I think can be beneficial. It's also complementary with exercise, which is improving uh, brain-derived neural growth factor and is also improving ketone uptake. So these are complementary and there may be other uh, non-pharmacological or pharmacological interventions of which ketones can contribute to um, improving brain energy status and helpfully hopefully slowing down the progression of this disease.
What we're talking about here is brain energy rescue with ketones. We think it's a key important component of cognitive health during aging. Uh, I hope I've uh, convinced you that brain glucose deficit is a specific problem related to glucose and is not a global problem of energy metabolism and that it contributes to the risk of Alzheimer's disease and a vicious cycle. And that there's normal brain glucose uptake has been demonstrated uh, independently in th by three different methods, which I haven't had the time to mention, but this is now a robust observation. Ketones can improve cognition in mild cognitive impairment and in Alzheimer's disease. There are multiple studies on this now, but most of them are short-term and will need to be extended. There may be an indication of an improvement in neuropathology that has been reported two years ago by CSF levels of, of markers. So this needs to be followed up and compared with the plasma values, which we don't see any change. I think reducing insulin resistance is contributing to brain problems with brain glucose uptake. It's a problem that is independent of age, and it is a problem that we absolutely need to address if we want to improve cognitive health during aging. So ketones are potentially part of the solution, but we need to improve glucose tolerance and perhaps have other interventions as well. Ultimately, larger, longer-term RCTs are definitely going to be needed.